Vandeham Shiguru Shiyuta Padatamalam Shiguru Vaishnavamscha Shiru Pam Sagaja Tam Sahagana Bhagana Tam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sagadutam Parijana Sitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha Uma Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pustaya Bhutamai, Sri Makti Makti Vedanta Swami Tinamai, Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Puchari De Nirvase Sasunya Vadi, Astyakya De Sitari Ne, Manchakalpa Tarubis Jakripa Sindhu, Ve Vachapatitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namaho Namaha. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. uh, Diptesh, are you there? <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes. Hare Krishna, my obeisances. I was wondering if uh, I could speak to you on the phone after our conference here. Mm -hmm. Sure, Maharaj, yes. Yeah, I think I have your number. Uh, but um, yeah, I think uh, I think he gave, uh, Tushar gave me your number. So I'll give you a call. But okay, if you like, you can call me. Maybe that's safer because... Uh, I don't have your number, Maharaj, but uh, I can, I can. All right, I'll, I'll try calling you with the number he gave me. Okay. Let's, let me, let me see if this is it. Uh, let's, uh, let's see. It says, uh, let me see if I can get it. In the, uh, four, four, seven, nine, oh, nine. Six eight six seven one two. Yes, that's the right number. Yeah. Okay. That one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So, um, uh, yesterday we spoke on the appearance of Srivastakur. Yesterday was his. Divine Appearance Day, a very important day for celebrating the Panchatattva. Um, the day before, we began a series of uh, talks on health. And uh, on, uh, I think it was on Friday or Saturday, Saturday, we spoke on um, um, the eating part of health, food intake, and some general principles about health. How today in uh, modern society, people generally fall ill because of irregulated habits. Mm -hmm. This is mentioned in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, in one purport where Srila Prabhupada makes this point that generally in this age, especially in Kali Yuga, uh, people don't follow routines when it comes to to life itself. The only thing that keeps them into a routine is generally their work hours. Or if they go to school, that. But on, the, on an individual personal basis, people have a gen tendency not to follow a routine. They eat when they want. Um, they sleep when they want. You know, they do things according to uh, feelings and moods uh, rather than in a regulated way. And regulation is the basis for 
success in all activities because it allows one to keep oneself focused on life's activities. For a devotee, it's the same thing. His divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, he was highly regulated. Uh, so much so that he, uh, when he would travel, wherever he would travel from and to, uh, he would pick up the time frame where he appeared. In other words, it didn't matter what time it was when he landed wherever he was, he would resume his schedule accordingly from that particular time period. Um, I could just give you a little bit of a uh, quick glance at Srila Prabhupada's schedule. And this is his general schedule. There was some adjustments according to preaching, which Prabhupada was doing constantly. But even within the preaching field, he maintained a pretty strong sense of regulation. He would take rest, as he would always say, between 10, 30, and 11 every night. And he would wake up around 12 o'clock. In other words, he would rest for an hour, an hour and a half, the most, hour and a half. And then he would begin his translation work on the Srimad Bhagavatam, carefully studying all of the commentaries by the previous acharyas, such as Jiva Goswami, Vishwanar Chakravarti Thakur, his Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, the, far, the father of Srimad Bhagavatam, Sridhar Swami. Um, and sometimes other than some of the less commentators like Yagya Vokya and others who commented on the Shrutis or the Vedas. So Prabhupada would study their commentaries and then write his Bhaktivedanta purports based on the verse, using their input and adding the Western understanding uh, Prabhupada knew his audience was Western and he wanted to somehow make it understandable and very relevant to, to the Western mentality. So he adjusted some of the principles to fit into that concept without taking away from the essential teachings. Um, Srila Prabhupada would spend two to three hours, maybe more sometimes, and then he would begin his japa somewhere around three or four o'clock in the morning, and he would chant around six o'clock every day. He would go, he would meet some of his senior devotees and others, and they would go on the morning walk. Prabhupada was quite religious on his morning walk, because in 1967, Prabhupada had his third heart attack. And that time the devotees called in a, a Jewish doctor <laughs> from America. And he gave Prabhupada some really good advice. He said, you must every day walk, and you must every day take massages. So Prabhupada began his massages and walks, which he continued for the remainder of the time he was with us each day. And even when it was cold out, he would do his morning walks. And there is even one incident where Prabhupada was in Switzerland in the middle of the winter. And uh, it was blizzard snow outside, it wasn't possible to go outside, Prabhupada had taken up a hotel room um, he came to a place called St. Helena <laughs> interesting place, Prabhupada called it St. Hell <laughs> he changed the word around it was always snowing but in the hotel room they had these corridors 
the Prabhupada would go into the corridors and walk back and forth along the corridors and that way he would fulfill his uh, need for a morning walk. And sometimes there would be his assistants and others with him and he would carry on conversations. So Prabhupada was very keen, you might say, or diligent to maintain his health knowing that um, his body needed it Otherwise, he wasn't able to maintain his rigid schedule. And his schedule was quite rigid. We cannot imagine keeping up with Prabhupada's schedule. At 6 a.m., he would take his uh, morning walk. And usually, he would end up at the temple around the time of greeting of the deities, which was usually around 7 o'clock. And then um, he would... Uh, um, take the take darshan of the deities as they appeared then he would receive the guru puja and after guru puja he would give the Srimad bhagavatam class this was his regulation after bhagavatam he would return to wherever he was staying and he would have breakfast Prabhupada's breakfast was always quite light except when it was cold out most of the time Prabhupada had fresh fruit, uh, some chickpeas, uh, maybe eight or 10 chickpeas with some salt and pepper on them. He would also like fried cashews. They would take cashews and fry it in ghee and give it to Prabhupada. And uh, he would always take a sandesh or a rascula. He said that sandesh and rascula are not sweets. He called them tonic. <laughs> this is what he called, referred to Sandesh and Raskul as tonic, which means a type of medicine. <laughs> After breakfast, Prabhupada would lay down for approximately an hour just to rest. Usually he wouldn't sleep, but just rest. After that, he would wake up and he would have his morning massage. Shruti Kirti Prabhu was the person or usually if there was a different personal servant, they learned how to massage Srila Prabhupada in a certain way. He taught them how to massage. Prabhupada would take a massage from an hour and a half to sometimes two hours. And while he was taking his massage, he would, uh, the devotees would read the letters that the disciples wrote to Prabhupada and others. And Prabhupada would dictate the responses to the letters and the devotees would type it up. And that's how Prabhupada got his letter writing and uh, letter receiving uh, completed. After his massage, uh, this would get him close to lunchtime and then he would uh, um, take a bath and get change into fresh clothes and get ready for lunch. Uh, lunch was generally the same for Prabhupada, dal, rice, sabji, chapati. That was Prabhupada's standard diet for lunch. Sometimes someone would cook something else special they would make for him and he would accept it. Prabhupada ate lunch alone, he never and we were talking about this on Saturday when we talked about the process of food. Prabhupada never liked to talk and eat at the same time because he knew it's not good for digestion. But that was secondary. Um, Prabhupada would like to meditate on the food as being Krishna because Krishna is, comes in the form of prasadam and Prabhupada had that realization. So uh, many years ago, I went to the Los Angeles temple and I went to Prabhupada's room and the devotee showed me where Prabhupada would take prasadam. And he had a table facing the wall in a small corner and Prabhupada would face the corner where he couldn't see anything else but the corner of the wall. And in front of him was the prasadam. Prabhupada liked to 
uh, absorb himself into prasadam. And this is also important for devotees to understand that prasadam is actually Krishna. It's not just food. Prasadam should be tasty, prepared nicely, healthy, not overly spiced or not bland. Uh, some people think that no spices are good, but actually spice is necessary for digestion. And too much spicing can change the bodily constitution where one uh, upsets the balance of the body by over spicing. So one has to balance spices nice. So it's always good to have a person to cook for you or you cook for yourself. Prabhupada said, if you cook for yourself, you always find yourself very healthy because your own energy goes into that food you cook and that balance, because it's coming from you and coming back to you, it balances you nicely. If you have your wife cooking for you, or if you are the lady, you cook for yourself generally, for the family, then everything should be done nicely. Everything should be clean. When Prabhupada was done cooking, he would also teach us how to cook. He made sure that when he was done, you could see the kitchen was just as clean as it was when he started. He would clean and cook simultaneously and not simply just cook and then the kitchen was a mess and then it takes an hour and a half to clean. It's not like that. <laughs> Prabhupada was expert at cooking and devotees. Uh, one minute. Don't offer, don't offer to hire this. No, no, just to, uh, just do, just, just, I mean, just for Hari Das, don't offer to go and give you money. Excuse me. If Prabhupada would meditate when he was cooking, and no one could, he would never speak while he was cooking. If he really wanted, if he had some assistance in his cooking, he would always indicate what he would want by making gestures and pointing to different things. So he maintained a very serene and a very uh, devotional mentality during the process of cooking, which helps to balance the energies because the whole world, everything is based on energy. People get sick, be sick because of an imbalance of energies. Energies affect your consciousness. Energy is everywhere. So when you learn how to balance the energies, you can find yourself finding more and more uh, peacefulness in your mind, and at the same time, a more healthy lifestyle. Of course, we live, when we live in the cities, the energies are already imbalanced by the city's activities. So we have to work with that. But at least from our side, we have to be careful. So Prabhupada, when he would uh, take prasadam, he would uh, face the wall or an area where he wasn't seeing anyone and he would meditate on prasadam. Then he would ring his bell. If he wanted anything during the prasadam, his servant would be nearby and he kept a bell. And he would ring the bell and the servant would come and bring Prabhupada's whatever he requested. At the end, he would ring the bell and the servant would come in and clean, take everything away, clean everything nicely. Prabhupada, right after lunch, he again took another hour approximately of rest. And then after that, he would get up and then he would meet devotees or whatever was going on at that particular day meeting people, when people would come to meet him, he would meet them in the afternoon in the evening time, or he would do programs outside in the evening like that. So this was a little bit about how Srila Prabhupada's schedule was so rigid. 
I spoke to one of his servants and, and we get a little insight about Prabhupada's, how he managed his health and how he managed his schedule. Um, and we see now generally for those of us who are younger, that's not me, I'm just saying those who are younger, generally it's not recommended by Ayurveda to, to, to rest during the day. When you get older, a little rest is good after a meal, generally. Prabhupada says when you get older, you generally don't sleep at long periods of time. You usually generally sleep shorter periods of time more often. But that's for people like when we're talking about 70 plus like that, or even in the late 60s. Uh, one minute again, I have to say something. Um, bring a little salad to me. Okay, uh, one thirty. bring everything. Okay. Okay. Um, so we learn a little bit about the importance of regulation and health tips from Srila Prabhupada. Um, His Holiness Palatananda Maharaj has written or compiled a book called, called I Hope This Meets You in the Best of Health. This title was what Srila Prabhupada used to write at the end of every one of his letters. He would always say, hoping this meets you in the best of health, your ever well-wisher, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. That's how he would sign his letters. He always was enthusiastic to give his blessings for the best health of the devotees. And he always encouraged the devotees to take care (coughs) of good health. Um, As he said, in which we mentioned earlier, um, Prabhupada said, health, sadhana, service, in that order. So he put health first, sadhana second, and service third. Because he understood that if we don't have good health, then we are not be able to keep up the standard of our service and our sadhana. So there are people who are called hypochondriacs, <laughs> that's the other extreme, where they're always thinking about health 24 hours a day. Their drawers are full of medicines. They wash their hands every five minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like there is a, there's a fanatic type of health regimen that people take to, but that's not Krishna consciousness, nor is it even normal hygiene. So one should balance the health principles. And what is that? Proper eating, proper sleeping, and proper fresh air and exercise. These are very, very important. Health is a very complex subject matter, very complex. It's hard to really understand what it means to take care of health. There is the general principles and then there's the individual who work according to the general principles, but can adjust according to time, place, and uh, situation. Because people are different. We have different bodies like that but the general principles are the same. Um, One of the more important principles of health is proper sleeping. I'm gonna speak a little bit about sleeping today. Uh, Not too long, but just a few minutes. Um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur comments on this. He says, every hour you rest before midnight is worth two hours of rest after midnight. 
And so Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, he was, he used to get, go to rest about 8.30 every night. And he would wake up around midnight. And then he would also do his writings and other types of uh, clerical and scriptural studies and works, writing books and other things. So uh, we don't recommend that, but it's it's recommended to not to take rest late, any later than 10 o'clock in the evening. If you sleep sufficiently, it depends on you. Prabhupada told us no more than six hours, generally a day we sleep. For some cases, it could be a little bit more. 10 hours a day is that you're actually calling you're calling ill health to come if you sleep more than seven hours a day, seven and a half. Some of us may need eight hours a day, but that's a rare case. But generally, um, six hours are considered to be sufficient. And there's a study on sleep where people who sleep more than eight hours are more inclined for shorter lives than people who sleep five and six hours a night. So too much sleep is unhealthy. <laughs> too little sleep is also unhealthy. That's why Krishna mentions in the Bhagavad Gita in the sixth chapter, one should not eat too much or eat too little, sleep too much or sleep uh, not enough. He also talks about balancing these things. Uh, one of the tips about sleeping is that one should sleep in a very good area where there's enough ventilation, where you can breathe nicely at night while you're resting. If you're in closed, stuffy rooms, even in the winter time, it could also be very detrimental to the health and one may not sleep properly. So one should make sure there's good ventilation wherever they are. Uh, if you want to rest completely, make sure the atmosphere is completely dark. There was this wrong conception that was going on, a wrong idea that you need to sleep with a light on, but that destroys the ability for the mind to rest. And there's a particular part of the brain it's right in the center where if light is there, that keeps that part of the brain activated and then the brain doesn't rest properly. So it's mentioned both by in the scriptures and by others who study the scriptures that one should sleep in a, a completely dark room. That is the best. Sleep with your head either facing east or south. They say east is meditative sleep, south is energizing sleep, west is dreaming sleep, north is uh, diseased sleep. So always keep your head either east or south like that. That's generally the case. Some people find that doesn't work for them. But there, that's a rare situation, but that's general. Even Prabhupada did that. He would always, um, when he would go to different places, he would ask which direction is east. I always carry a compass with me when I travel, so I know which direction to sleep in, like that. Like that, so that that's also very like that. Um, so these are some basic principles. I can talk much more about sleeping. It's a whole subject matter, but I'll get into that a little at another time. These are some of the basic principles like that um, for resting. Um, don't end your day on the computer and then go to sleep. It's not good for the sleep patterns. Uh, try to give yourself enough break from the computer at least two to three hours before you take rest at night. And again, as I mentioned in the earlier talk, uh, eating should not 
um, be so late that we take rest right after that, that's not really healthy. That can cause diabetes. And there's a lot of people, I've seen it in, in especially in the Indian culture, people suffer from diabetes a lot and that's due to eating large meals in the evening where it doesn't digest properly. And then there is glucose that is produced and then diabetes appears. So I'll be careful like that. Prabhupada was also very enthusiastic to teach us not to eat much in the evening. He said, take a glass of milk or something very light the most and uh, that way you can rest easy like that. Okay, these are some tips on health along with some of the things that Prabhupada did to maintain his own health. So I'll open it up for discussion. Thank you so much Guru Maharaj. It was a very important point actually you covered about the sleep. Uh, and health. Uh, so it's a very good session going on. Devotees, if you have any questions, comments, uh, please unmute yourself and ask. Otherwise, you can type it in the chat box. I'll speak. I'll read it out for you. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna, Guru um, So, as per Ayurveda, um, most of the time people say that, and I, I saw devotees say that a um, lot of things don't eat this, don't eat this, uh, that, like that. So many restrictions are there as per Ayurveda. So, um, but uh, but when we um, when we try to buy something when in the market, we see a lot of things and we are getting tempted to buy all those things. But as per Ayurveda, um, um, there are a lot of restrictions. Uh, so do you recommend following Ayurveda principles, Guru Maharaj? Well, I would re recommend you do either one of two things. You find out your, your constitution, your basic bodily constitution, and then you align your diet with that constitution. That's the best. Or go see an Ayurvedic doctor and have him give you a, a food regimen. Uh, some of the devotees here in Slovenia, we have an Ayurvedic doctor here. They're going to see him. And he has been adjusting their diets regularly. <clears throat> uh, so uh, that's recommended, I think. What works for one person may not work for another exactly the same. So Ayurvedic has a general strictness on certain things, but there are variables depending on your constitution and depending on your lifestyle. Some people are more mentally active and some people are more physically active. So you have to adjust your food intake according to also your daily activities. Mm -hmm. So it's not so easy to um, simply hear about what you should take and not take and then follow that. There are tests you can take. I think it's about 90 questions. You can find them in many of the Ayurvedic uh, journals and other things that they, they test you by asking you questions and then you check a particular box and it gives you three or four answers. Once that's tabulated, then you can understand what is your dosius. We are either, we're either kalpa, kapa, pita, or vata, or vata pita, or pita kalpa. As a, basically, there's five constitutions. Generally, the people are mixed. Well, Vata people have a lot more trouble when they travel than Kalpa people. Kalpa people. Kalpa people have, can travel more and become strong through traveling, whereas Vata people have a difficult time traveling and it wipes them out physically. So you have to kind of know 
what your constitution is. It's not, it's kind of mandatory to find out what it is um, and uh, follow that. <laughs> there's food you should take and there's food you shouldn't take, but it's, it's a little bit variable. Like, you know, Ayurveda doesn't really allow for, you know, um, tomatoes. They don't, they're pretty strict against tomatoes. Uh, yogurt sometimes also, they're very strict against, you know, but you have to see what works for you. Best to get your constitution uh, analyzed and then find a diet from that. It's worth the time and energy. Yes, good morning. Yeah, recently I'm trying um, this uh, Ayurvedic schedule, but they say always uh, that skip the dinner, uh, skip the dinner and uh, keep your body light. Um, but if you skip the dinner, um, then sometimes um, the energy levels are so low that uh, we are unable to, I am unable to cope up with my uh, daily work here, uh, daily schedule. So sometimes it's getting a problem with me. Skipping um, the dinner means complete no dinner at all? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. That's too drastic. You should take something in the evening, such as a bowl of soup is good, or, um, you know, something light. Sometimes something light in the evening. You don't want to eat heavy in the evening, but skipping completely, I don't think that's Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. Ayurveda doesn't really recommend you skip in the evening. Just keep, they say keep it light, yeah. light, light and short. Like when I was, I, I went from, I went through many Ayurvedic clinics for four or five years in a row. I was going to an Ayurvedic clinic every year to get my health back or get my energy back. And they would always recommend I take something in the evening, something light, like we would have like, you know, dahlia is right, dahlia. That's good. Dahlia. I would take it like um, some dahlia in the me evening, or maybe one popper, or um, you know, something light like that. Or um, some people just take a glass of milk. Some people take some tea and some dried fruit. I don't. Know. You have to see what works for you. The idea is keep it light in the evening. But cutting it out completely is not is not good because the next morning you're going to be really hungry, and sometimes that affects your japa, and it also affects your uh, breakfast. Yes, good night. Yeah. That sounds too dry. I don't. I never heard Ayurvedic saying you should you shouldn't eat nothing in the in the evening. Yeah, it's part of this intermittent fasting, Guru Maharaj, um, where we eat only uh, one time or two times a day and uh, uh, we skip the next part of the meal. Um, so like that, it's a part of intermittent fasting nowadays. Well, if you're doing a fast or you're trying to lose weight, then skipping does help like that. The fastest way to lose weight is don't eat. <laughs> no, no, there's no diet that, that you can actually adopt that makes you lose weight. Diets don't work. Yeah. You want to lose weight, don't eat. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it works. <laughs> Generally. But, uh, you know, take something light before you take rest, maybe an hour, an hour and a half, two hours before you take rest. That way you can rest nicely. That's good manage. Thank you so much, good manage. Yeah, that's my recommendation. That's good manage. Yeah, Vivek Prabhu, you have a hands up. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, you mentioned about directions for sleeping as suggested by uh, Srila Prabhupada also. 
and uh, many also suggest direction for like various like temple altars cooking like for various things while on the other side i learned that if you are trying to follow krishna consciousness then we don't need to worry about these directions and vastu because krishna no, is going no, to take no, no 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 you generally if you're a pure devotee you don't have to worry about <laughs> but uh like the apartment i'm in when i i moved into this apartment last july and uh and when i got in here the next day i wanted to leave <laughs> because the energy was so bad i mean really bad and so i struggled to stay here i can i could feel how how bad the energy was because i'm living a little bit away from the devotee And I mean, a few doors down from the temple. It's close, but still, it's in another area. And uh, so I had one. I have a disciple and his wife who are expert at Vastu. They came in and they did a whole Vastu thing for me, and they just showed me how to readjust the area, which would maximize. You know, they say don't sleep and work in the same room. In other words, don't keep your desk. and your bed in the same room that's usually against vastu the brahmastan if you know about vastu the brahmastan is the center in the room and the and the place i am the brahmastan is the bathroom which is the worst place for the brahmastan to be so we put up some swastikas with some uh, bowls of water to catch the energy and adjust it I had to adjust my sleeping places. Finally, I found a place where I could sleep and get up easier. Prior to that, so I did a lot of adjusting in this place, and still am adjusting things. And I found that it's a big change. So, Basta was good. Maybe we shouldn't be fanatical. about it and make that the center of our life but it's supportive vastu is part of ayurveda it's part of the uh, part of the vedas you know? and you can see the difference when your home is aligned in with the vastu principle as opposed to when it's not because everything is energy <laughs> we chanting hari krishna we're, we're pulling the spiritual energy towards us okay. everything material energy goodness passion and ignorance is all around us in the form of this material uh atmosphere everything is energy people put out a certain energy people accept certain energies everything is energy we want to stay connected to the spiritual energy it's not that you can go into a bar room and you know live there and expect to practice krishna consciousness in that atmosphere because the atmosphere is just <laughs> completely opposite of the spiritual energy yeah so I follow I I don't really get into it too much but I just have my disciples come and check things out we put the altar in my in a certain place and my desk in a certain place bed in a certain place everything try to arrange everything in such a way that it maximizes the spiritual energy Thank you Guru Maharaj Sometimes people Yeah, sometimes people get sick simply because they live in bad energies. That's all. It's really helpful. Thank you, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Yeah. Anything that supports our Krishna consciousness, we want. Anything that takes away from it, we want to, you know, get away from.
Thank you, Vivek Prabhu. Uh, Guru Maharaj, we have two questions in the chat. Uh, one is from Noria Mataji. Uh, the question is, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, thank you very much for your class. I have a question. Eating time and sleeping time are part of sadhana. So how to educate ourselves, body and mind to plan a schedule? Well, you have to see what works. The bed, to educate yourself, you can take advice from others and you can see what works by adjusting your present schedule to improve it. Generally, we spoke, we were meant to get up, wake up an hour and a half be before the Brahma Mohartha hour. Uh, we should rise during the Brahma Mohartha hour. Brahma Mohartha hour is an hour and a half before sunrise. So the Brahma Mohartha consists of 48 minutes times two. Generally, that's it. So it's mentioned, yeah. So if we wake up too late, that's not good. Wake up too early, that's also not good. I got a letter from one devotee just the other day. He said, I'm going to start getting up at one o'clock in the morning. And then I'm going to do this and do that and do that. I was thinking this is, you know, he's just not going to be able to maintain it. It's just, we have to find that balance where you, where you can get enough rest. And so organizing your eating first, and then you can organizing your sleeping in relationship to that, because your eating affects your sleeping. So get some help, get some advice, see what you're doing now and see where you can improve on it. And that's all. Adjust. For eating, always eat those foods that are more difficult to digest at the beginning of the meal because then the fire of digestion is the strongest at the beginning of the meal. Take some ginger before you begin your meal. And if you want to increase your digestion, add some salt to the ginger. Now try to take salt that is pure salt. They have this rock salt or Himalayan salt, this store-bought salt that you find that are iodized salt, that stuff is poison. Stay away from iodized salt. It's the worst stuff in the, on the market bad for the body, bad for the bones. Um, you know, there's so much to consider. There's so much to consider. What are you doing? I didn't know. He just, he got his lunch. That's, his, that's enough. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. One minute. Hare Krishna. Yes, Guru Maharaj, we can hear you now. Okay, so these are things to consider. And Nuriya Mataji, thank you, Guru Maharaj. She said, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, so we have another question, Guru Maharaj, from Sri Devi Mataji. She is saying, dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, all glory, Shla Prabhupada and your holiness. Thank you for this class. And my question is, what are the best times for breakfast, lunch and dinner? 
Uh, best, best time for breakfast is between 7.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. Lunch is from 12.30 a.m. to 1.30 uh, p.m. Uh, I'm 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. And dinner is usually between six and seven. Yes, that's okay, Vishu Devi Mataji. Uh, devotees, if you have any other questions, you can uh, unmute. That's coming from uh, an Ayurvedic doctor who instructed me on, on this. So. Don't eat late afternoon. That's not so good. Better to eat lunch no later than 1.30. Okay, so yeah. can we stop here or is that it? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes, yeah, she said, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Um, so yeah, we almost finished your time, an hour. It's 12.30 here in UK. So uh, if you like, we can stop it now. Okay, yeah, good. Thank you very much. We'll continue with this health Thing. We'll get into the spiritual aspect of the health also and some other uh, correlate, correlate, correlating principles that can support health because right now, particularly, it's a, it's a big issue, but it's always an issue that health and well, you know, the most important thing is our Krishna consciousness. But if our health is not up to par, it's hard to practice devotional service. You can always do something, but still you might not be able to serve to your capacity. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru. Yeah, Diptesh, I'll, I'll give you a call. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay, Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj.